please join me in welcoming Ambassador Eileen Donahoe. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Great. So I was laughing earlier today when uh, our um, colleague Ivan Simonovich was saying that the, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights is the place that basically can be principled and do what it thinks is right, whereas the Human Rights Council has to live in the real world, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I thought we would just start with just a little bit of history about the Human Rights Council and U.S. engagement there. Why did President Obama decide to seek membership uh, in the council, especially in light of its reputation or the previous um, embodiment's reputation as such a dysfunctional place to pursue human rights? First, let me just say what a fabulous program you've put on. Thank you. Really so interesting to be here. I'm sure those of you who have lasted through the day would agree. It's such an eclectic group. And from the top to the bottom, it's been so interesting. Great to see Maina Kiai again and all the people you had. Um, thank, you. thank you for including me. So I would say um, President Obama's decision to seek membership at the Council obviously marked a really distinct change in philosophy. Um, so just to give a little bit of history, the Human Rights Council was not formed until 2006. And uh, its predecessor entity, the Commission on Human Rights, was just generally understood to be a failed entity. Kofi Annan wanted to start anew. Uh, the Human Rights Council was created. It was during the Bush years. Um, and at that time, I'm sure all of you know, um, the Bush administration was just not enamored of the UN, with the UN or multilateral engagement, et cetera. And you know, the, many in the administration saw multilateral engagement at the UN as a form of compromising on US sovereignty. Obama administration had a very different perspective. I would say Susan Rice was a very central uh, player in the conversation about seeking membership at the council. Um, I also have to admit, within the Obama administration, it was a very contested decision. And, um, and yet there was, at the end of the day, a basic confidence is that if we sent a representative there and gave full-throated voice to our values and you know, our positions, that the US could make a difference. Um, I think people were stunned by the opportunity that we found there uh, to have an impact and to um, make friendships, make partnerships on some of our core values. So it, it was a tough choice. It marked a distinct change in policy that absolutely represents um, a core tenet of the Obama administration, but it far exceeded expectations. We heard earlier today Taylor Branch was talking about the importance of optimism at the core um, of, mm -hmm. of the human rights movement. Yeah. Um, but when you arrived in Geneva as, as the first U.S. ambassador to the Human Rights Council, it must have been a little bit difficult to maintain that, that kind of optimism. What, what was the political dynamic that you, that you found there and the institutional issues that you found challenging? Um, well, the good news for me was that I came in with a, such a clear sense of purpose, and I felt deep passion and certainty that we were doing the right thing in trying to build up this institution. Um, and that clarity, that, that sense of correctness, um, really, really goes a long way. Um, I also would say we found a res very deep reservoir of goodwill for the United States. Uh, as some of your previous speakers have said, we, the, as a country, we are generally associated with, deeply with human rights, you know, up and downs in different administrations, but we are associated with human rights. And I think President Obama himself really represented something very new and refreshing, and people wanted to hope. People wanted to give us another shot. Um, and we're ready for outreach. And so um, what we did uh, was basically you know, use human skills for any kind of interaction, which is 
you, you, you go out, you engage with anybody who's willing to talk to you. We sought partnerships wherever we could find them. Um, we listened to people's perspectives very hard, very carefully. We showed respect. And those simple human behaviors yielded tremendous results in terms of new partnerships, people willing to come on board. They, they loved the idea that the United States was treating them as equals. And um, just brought a, we brought a new tone uh, to the council. And I, and I also have to mention that the Human Rights Council has 47 members uh, d divided among the five regions of the UN based on the number of countries per region. So 13 for Africa, 13 Asia, eight Latin America, seven Western Europe and other group, which is what we're, the United States is in, and six from Eastern Europe. But everybody is it equal. One vote, one country. And so nobody has a veto power. And oddly, we use that to our benefit. Uh, because when, when a handful of countries have veto power, it can end up being a very dysfunctional place because those, those countries don't actually have to listen or engage or create compelling narratives about why their position should dominate. And I found personally that going out and treating others as equals and, and expressing that awareness actually got us votes and support. Um, I, I also would say we came in you know, full recognition. This was, you know, it, it had been a very dysfunctional organization, not just the predecessor entity, the council itself. I think in the first year, 2006, uh, every country specific resolution was on Israel but one, which was on Sudan, you know, Darfur crisis. And, um, we were t they were talking about international solidarity, which nobody knew what it meant. It was a Cuban-run resolution. And um, so we came in with the idea that we would change the agenda, get the council focused on real crisis and chronic, egregious chronic human rights situations. We wanted to put the focus on human rights defenders who we believed were, you know, our, we understood our job to essentially be empowering and ensuring the ability of human rights defenders to do the real work in the world. Also get attention on victims because we understood that the emotional punch that would come from an awareness of those who had suffered would uh, translate into results. And then the third thing we tried to do was, um, mix up the dynamics between uh, regional groups. Because in the, in the past, UN-wide, there's known the dysfunction comes from uh, members of, of regional groups believing that they have to stand by each other in solidarity and not allow criticism of each other. And that's a, for, that's a way you protect yourself, is if you protect your friends, then they protect you when it's, when it's your turn. And we chose to um, believe that we could get around that and, and break up those regional blocks. Um, and we sort of, we always said we would appeal to everybody's better angels and address uh, arguments on the merits rather than on the politics as, as a starting place. And we found tremendous uh, receptivity. And uh, a, a really good example, uh, was our first initiative on a core civil political right, freedom of assembly and association, a new, res a new um, special rapporteur, and Maina Kia is in the room. When we went out and tried to find partners, we, we tried to talk about the right to freedom of assembly and association in terms that would uh, generate a sense of self-recognition. So you know, we brought up the solidarity movement in Poland and the mothers of the disappeared in in Argentina, and you know, place to place to place, even to the point where we we would argue that some of the ambassadors with whom we were interfacing literally would not be there, but for freedom of assembly and association, which had brought revolutions or transitions in their own governments and allowed them to be there, and it worked. And it, it, in other words, it wasn't just American values or American priorities. 
it was no, that's our, we identify with that right. That's ours, and we're going to stand up and support it. So, you know. That's great. That, that's because I was going to ask you, you know, how about, um, you know, in the past, I, I remember that we were mostly working with the Europeans, the Canadians, you know, they were our allies. We were, you know, pushing and often getting defeated. Um, what about some of the emerging uh, powers? Have we been able, have they stepped up, you know, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia? I know, you know, there was a lot of hope that, that these powers would um, really become leaders at the, at the UN Human Rights Council. And how is that, how have you experienced that? Mixed. Um, it, particularly the ones you mentioned. So let, let me, st the general concept um, would be that, for example, Canada and the EU, great uh, leaders in some regards, but for example, Canada is particular leader on women's rights, the EU has led on Belarus, and especially on the death penalty and a variety of other things. We found that we actually, um, were less effective if we only turned to Western partners, very clearly. I mean, and, and, that's, and that is now a known, uh, it's sort of a modus operandi for anyone who wants to move forward on any initiative. They now understand if you only turn to your own group on a tough issue, you're less likely to succeed. And that is especially true in the WIAG group, the Western group, um, because people can too easily fall back into the, oh, that's just a Western value or, you know, whatever. So um, we always would f turn to partners from other places in the world. And so I brought up the example of Freedom of As Assembly and Association, where our partners were Indonesia, Mexico, Lithuania, the Maldives, Nigeria, Czech Republic, and the United States. And that was a very potent group. Uh, another really good example is internet freedom, where we ha had Brazil, um, which I can say a little bit about, Turkey, Tunisia, uh, obviously Sweden, the United States, and Nigeria. And again, though, that's the kind of coalition that gives you security and votes. And, and once you have that kind of a coalition working together, you make it that much more likely that no one will call a vote because people can count votes. And, and they know, well, we kn so every now and then somebody will say, you know, oh, we, we have to go down on our version of principle and we'll call a vote against something that's important. But um, generally, that doesn't happen. But to your, uh, I mean, I, I would say in, in terms of the, uh, Brazil and South Africa, we, very much a mixed picture uh, because they also associate with the BRICS, uh, which is, the, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And um, from where I sat, uh, that, that grouping was not very helpful at all on the human rights dimensions. I mean, I understand why they would associate on economic issues, but in terms of human rights issues, they should not be aligned. And to the extent that they try to align themselves, it ends up meaning that the Brazils and the South Africas end up going to a lower common denominator in terms of human rights values. And it, and it ends up being damaging. Um, where we did find incredible leadership in unexpected places was in some of the small delegations like the Maldives, uh, Montenegro, where to some extent it depended on the um, effectiveness of the ambassadors who, in, in those two cases, these two women ambassadors who were clear thinking, clear voiced, and a little bit fearless and very effective. So, um, I, and I would also say their countries, they, they had the cover of their, from their governments to go out on a limb because they wanted to be understood to be leaders on human rights. That's interesting that you say that because, you know, we, we were talking over lunch about 
Eleanor Roosevelt and the power of her personal commitment yep. and also uh, Charles Malik and how, you know, how sometimes individual personalities and commitment backed by government, uh, sometimes and sometimes not, yep. uh, um, sometimes maybe getting out ahead of their governments a little bit, uh, can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And I don't doubt that, that the force of your personality in the lion's den there made a difference as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, is sort of the, the flip side of, you mentioned the, you know, the, um, the one-sidedness in terms of the country resolutions on Israel for such a long period of time. Um, the U.S. also gets criticized sometimes for being selective in the countries that it chooses to focus on um, at the council. You know, Susan Rice was talking about the hard cases, the easy cases and the hard cases, and um, and whether there's, you know, a little bit too much focus on the so-called easy cases, um, where the good guys and the bad guys are clearly lined up. Do you think there are political constraints on uh, the U.S. criticizing allies, like Saudi Arabia, for example, or Bahrain? How did you experience that dynamic? Very simple answer is yes. There are political constraints, plain and simple. Um, not devastating to those who want to prioritize human rights, but very real in some cases. And um, the two that you just mentioned are obvious ones. And I'd say in the, in the Bahrain case, um, just because it was you know, such an obvious example and it was part of the Arab Spring, uh, which you know, the Arab Spring presented a tremendous opportunity to all the members of the Human Rights Council, and we tried to seize upon it. And we got a green light to, to move on Libya, and that was the first opportunity. We did not get a green light to move on Egypt before that, which had happened just before. Um, but nobody else moved either. Uh, on Libya, it was the UK and the, you know, the US coming together, and you know, we got a green light to move on that. And, and it sort of galvanized the other members of the council um, it, it, to take on what was our first real-time crisis of big proportions. And so it was very exciting. And then that led to taking on Syria, which again, at the time, uh, the US various players in the US government were fairly frustrated by our inability to do anything. And so as soon as I, re I can remember the phone call um, with Sam Powers and Suzanne Nossel, and it was sort of like I, there, there had been a, um, a funeral for some protesters, and the family members were gunned down. And I remember there was this different kind of emotional energy around that incident. And I said, I think I smell a special session. And, and they said, go. You've got green light. Go take it and run with it. And the council has been pretty much preoccupied with Syria ever since. The case of Bahrain, very different. Frankly, you know, early on, we weren't really supposed to utter the word Bahrain because it was, you know, there are different players in the U.S. government who have different equities, see things from different perspectives, and on that country, at, in that time frame, those voices trumped. And it was challenging for us because we would be questioned on our double standards, and et cetera, et cetera. And what I tried to do is say, you know, I, I didn't try to, to you know, claim that it wasn't true or that it wasn't a case that didn't, uh, war didn't warrant attention, but it was, you know, there are other potential leaders and that, you know, if somebody else should be stepping up to the plate and leading on that initiative and forcing the United States to show its cards and we have to vote. So um, that's why I felt comfortable with that is that, you know, the United States can't lead on everything where even we agree with our allies other players have to step up and have the guts and do the work. So you've got to spread it around. Um, and, and that's one thing I would say. More players should step up to the plate on the tough issues. I, I, um, I'm glad you spoke about Bahrain. I know from my own uh, visit to Bahrain and speaking with activists there, the importance that they placed on the ability to go to 
the Human Rights Council and raise these issues. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, the access that civil society activists have uh, to, the, to the Council and to UN human rights mechanisms more broadly. What can or should the United States government be doing to improve that access and also to uh, keep watch over and protect those who come and speak yeah. uh, out and then have to go back home and sometimes there's retaliation as has been the case I know in Bahrain. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll start by m noting the Human Rights Council is an intergovernmental body. It's f made up of member states in the UN. That said, everybody knows that the you know sort of civil society really is the heart and soul of the place, and and provides the substance, a lot of the ideas, the strategy for how to succeed, um, comes from civil society. They're very active there. They're exceedingly important. I personally turned, I was, you know, I almost would say more often to civil society when I really needed to work through difficult, challenging strategic problems I, that I knew who to go to. And um, so, it, you know, shockingly influential, even though it's an intergovernmental body. Um, I will also say that in the room, you know, where the council works, there, there are many cases where other governments would try to squelch the voices of civil society, and you know, the United States. We we prided ourselves on listening keenly, and you know, anytime there was a, an attempt to shut somebody down, we would speak up and defend their right to speak, and ultimately that became even the um, the bureau, the the president or whoever was presiding came to understand that they had, they also had to be prepared to speak up and ensure that uh, civil society members could speak. The other thing I have to say, and I, I think a few people mentioned it um, during the day, that there, you know, sort of the shrinking space for civil society you see around the world, well, some of that is also reflected in Geneva um, on a couple of regards, as you say, uh, civil society members coming to Geneva, going home and facing reprisals. I will tell you, in the case of Sri Lanka, it was extreme. And people were intimidated and harassed while they were in Geneva, and then they you know, got off the plane, and same thing at home, and you know, very dangerous circumstances. And then, uh, I think her name is Cao Shun Li, the woman who was trying to, from China, trying to come out for the Chinese UPR. She dis disappeared at the airport on her way over for the China UPR. So, you know, it, it, it has become a, a, a dangerous proposition for some human rights defenders to engage with the Human Rights Council. And I think we, we me, the membership is aware of this, the issue of reprisals has grown, um, but I think civil society, you know, all of you should be aware of this because it has become dangerous in many cases. Um, and I don't think we're making quite enough of it um, in, term, in some of these cases are just extreme. So. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review. That's one of the innovations of the Human Rights Council that made it different from uh, the Human Rights Commission. You know, one of its virtues is that it, it applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that's working in practice? And in particular, what, what has been the value of the UPR for civil society organizations working on human rights around the world? So um, the UPR is not a, per for anybody who's been in the room during a UPR, um, it's, it's not a perfect exercise. It, it, there are aspects of it that feel very stilted, as do many aspects of the UN, any, any kind of process there. That said, it has been a very important um, improvement and it, it's an important mechanism. And, and the, I'd say the primary reason it's important is that every country in the UN system has to go through it. Everyone is treated equally by the institution. Doesn't mean they're treated equally as a political matter by other states. That's global politics. But by the institution, they're treated equally. Uh, what that basically means is that by showing up and uh, you know, going through this process, countries are acknowledging that they are subject to universal human rights 
and that they um, the way that they make manifest those commitments is that they publicly articulate what the, their commitments are, what their practices are. And so I, I would say the creation of this mechanism and the fact that everybody has shown up and, and made an effort to try to defend their records on universal human rights terms really is significant in terms of um, showing that the human rights narrative and human rights values um, are the terms on which governments understand their own legitimacy. And I think, I think one of these earlier, it was the Canadian former foreign minister who talked about the basis of sovereignty. On some level, by submitting to a universal periodic review process and admitting that you have to articulate to the international community how you adhere to human rights standards and what your practices are, that's a form of saying your sovereignty is subject to um, your ability to adhere to human rights principles, to protect your people's security, et cetera. I think that's a tremendous um, uh, statement about uh, uh, the, the, what this body has done. I think that's a very important move. To your other part of your question about civil society, um, same thing. I, not only does civil society get to speak in the room, but more importantly, the Universal Periodic Review provides an opportunity, when it's working well, for civil societies to engage with their own governments at home. And it forces governments to, to hear from their civil society. Uh, not perfect, but generally, it, I think in, even in the worst cases, the civil society members, like I just said, China. You know, I'm not sure that the Chinese government's actually engaging in, with civil society in terms of their preparation. But those activists know they can come to Geneva and articulate what they see as the problems, and the Chinese government feels enough pressure to make people disappear at the airport because they don't want them to show up. That tells you it's fairly potent. And I will say, I, I know at least one member of the um, administration from DRL, Sunny is here. Um, she's ours now. You know. Oh, she's yours. That's right. <laughs> she's yours. So she knows very well how hard um, DRL and our administration in, engage, you know, went around the country meeting with civil society uh, members in state after state after state on multiple occasions. And I'd say this is one of the places where the US really showed its stripes. They took it really seriously, specifically in terms of the requirement that they uh, engage with civil society. I thought it was, from our perspective at Human Rights First, really revolutionary in the US in the way that the, that the administration did that. Because for the first time, you had um, not just internationally focused human rights groups, but um, you know, domestically right. focused civil society engaging around the universal standards. And that, that was really tremendous and, yes. a, and a first and has built more of a network now. Um, we're going to get to questions for you all, but I, I really want to ask, because I know you've given some thought to this, mm -hmm. Eileen, um, and there's been reference to these things throughout the day. I wonder what you see as the issues that make it difficult for the United States to be seen as a leader on human rights particularly in multilateral venues like the Human Rights Council, you know, whether it's the use of drones or surveillance or Guantanamo, the death penalty, our high incarceration rate. We have a lot of flaws. And, um, and the, you know, the one universal language that everybody around the world speaks and understands is hypocrisy. So how, you know, how have you navigated that and, and um, you know, not let that prevent us from being a positive force for human rights despite our many flaws? Yep. So um, let me divide my thoughts here into two areas. Um, one thing that where I was even stunned when I got to Geneva was to find the extent to which the U.S. is such an outlier on the death penalty. I, I, you know, so apparent. You know, I, I think the numbers are something like out of the 193 or whatever the 94 whatever countries in the U.N. system, 21 still have the death penalty as a practice. The US being one of them, we are apparently in the top five, along with China, Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. That's great company. Great company. And so we all, knew, we all know we have the death penalty, and many of us um, were against death penalty. But 
I didn't under, appreciate until I got there how much of an outlier we are. And I will tell you, people just sh scratch their heads. They cannot figure it out. Um, it feels like it's barbaric compared to our other values. It's not so much hypocrisy. They just don't get it. It, it doesn't make sense in terms of in the scheme of things with our other values. So that's one thing I, I you know, I think you know, the domestic politics may not allow that to move, um, but I can tell you it, that is something that should move. Um, and I think some players, and I come from California, and you know, I know there's been some move to, to emphasize the cost associated with the death penalty compared to other life imprisonment, et cetera. I mean, I think there's other ways to get at it, but we really embarrass ourselves, frankly, right now on that subject. Um, in terms of, what really is undermining our credibility now, it's been, t again, touched on a lot today, is, is our uh, counterterrorism policies. And um, I would say the, this idea that there's sort of this forever war on terror, and terrorists can be found anywhere, anytime, justifies anything, it has become deeply problematic. And so, um, you know, Guantanamo is one thing. Uh, the, the, the upside is that President Obama, from day one, has been so clear in articulating his desire to close it. Serious efforts have gone into that. The size has shrunk. It's still a big problem, but at least people are articulating a desire to close it. Uh, the use of drones is absolutely growing as an issue, um, and I think the last panel touching on the fact that we're, we haven't even articulated really our criteria. It's, it, it's, there's no transparency, um, you know, and the justification that, oh, no, that's a really bad guy. It, it doesn't cut it. It just doesn't cut it. And people, um, you know, they, they're, we're losing trust. Most important, though, I have to say, in the last six months, these disclosures on, on surveillance, mass surveillance, I think has been devastating, absolutely devastating to the US image abroad in terms of our leadership on human rights, our credibility, um, and the sense of hypocrisy, and also the fact that even uh, the panel with the, uh, uh, the former UK foreign minister, you know, he talked about there's got to be a different way to carve out how we treat our allies. How about citizens around the world? You know, we, we basically are throwing the notion of the right to privacy completely out the window through our mass surveillance and justifying our, we're, we're, we're also violating constitutional principles, but we don't even make an effort to talk about the, the human rights implications for people around the world. So, and I am very, very, very concerned that this could be kind of a, a tipping point, a very significant shift in terms of the U.S.'s ability to lead on human rights because of these practices. Okay, um, and I think that's, judging from today, that's, that's a widely shared view. Um, we're going to open it up. I have a few more questions here, but I want to open it up uh, for you all. And now that it's dark in here, Pardon me, I'm going to have to kind of shield my eyes so I can see you. We have mics. Please wait for the mic and identify yourself uh, and then ask your question. We have right up, right up front here first. My name is Yalem Zaud. I am a human rights activist from Ethiopia. My question is um, the new civil society law in Ethiopia, which uh, criminalizes human rights work um, and absolutely, you know, wipes out independent civil society organization, um, makes it very hard and difficult even for local NGOs to come and uh, probably even file some using the UPR mechanism. So, but the US government and other donors are. Um, trying to give money to the government to do the work of human rights. Human rights work is going to be done through, you know, through the government, then it's you know, what we call governmental 
government supported the Gongos, uh -huh. non-governmental organizations. So how, how does that really reconcile with um, U.S.'s effort in supporting human rights and democracy in these countries? And instead of trying to push um, the government using their, you know, U.S. Um, influence uh, to create a more enabling environment, um, you know, shifting it and completely abandoning to the sidelines civil society organizations. That is, you know, um, more complacence. How, how do you see that? How do you see that move? Thank you. So and again, this is this is something that we could almost ask Mina Kiai to have the case. The whole last report was written largely on this topic, um, and I, I'm pretty sure Ethiopia was one of your examples. So, um, which you told me about. I remember the meeting. <laughs> so, um, the huge problem, and, and this is this is something we heard about over my time in Geneva. The, the trend line was really bad. And, the, and governments are just getting more and more sophisticated about finding ways to squelch the voices of civil society through rules and regulations that on their face don't look so outrageous, but in effect are really uh, devastating to civil society. And uh, I think there, there has to, and that's why Amina's report was so important. I think there has to be increased sophistication of everybody else in understanding the effects of these laws and regulations, the use of funding restrictions, et cetera. Um, I, my understanding uh, is that the US government is fairly on top of this subject and has worked hard not only to fight for uh, openness in laws. I mean, I know there's been a big push in Egypt and a lot of other places to ensure that the the laws that they put in place don't have this effect, um, and they understand the difference between working with Gongos and in independent uh, civil society members. Um, but I, so I, all I can say is the U.S. is aware, is, is, to the extent I know, it considers this a top priority, is doing everything it can. And I think we have to increase awareness around the world of the, how devastating the effect is. Questions? Uh, yes, way in the back there. Thank you. My name is Gustavo Baloa. Um, I'm a human rights consultant. I'm from the Republic Democratic of Congo. My question here is about uh, the double standard of uh, the United States. Um, how does the United States can pretend to be more progressive in terms of advancing human rights? And at the same time, we see like he's playing uh, a double standard game by, for example, the case of uh, the International Criminal Court that the federal government is not signatory of the convention. Um, and at the same time, the government can cooperate with other states to bring the purpose of, of human rights violence into the justice, while the American themselves citizen who are violating human rights somewhere, like in Iraq or Libya, or, can be brought to the justice. Two. I have uh, a concern about up to date, I never understood why the United States went to Iraq. Why we have, prior to the government going to Iraq, we had the United Nations report saying that Saddam Hussein didn't have a weapon of mass destruction. And the United States is a member of the uh, United Nations. And at the same time, is the first country to violate international standard. How do you explain that? Thank you. Well, thank easy question. <laughs> Not as hard as they sound. So uh, let me take the second question first, which is um, I, I, I agree with you. And the good news is that President Obama would agree with you. And um, you, you know the decision to go into Iraq uh, when you know there were weapons inspectors, Hans Blix was on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. You know, going against the UN um, is something that this administration, at least, 
um, understood to have been a, a bad decision, not in the U.S. interests and not, uh, not in, consistent with international law. Um, and I think that many in the United States have come to see it that way as well, and I think that's the way it'll go down in history, uh, along with the global community. Um, on the ICC question, um, I agree with you there as well. Um, it, you know, as I understand it, even though this isn't exactly what I did at the Human Rights Council, our policy is a little bit, it's a case-by-case, -case, ad hoc policy. And we are, we have, we're not signatories, and, or we're sign, we, we've signed but not ratified. Signed, we're sort of, and then, then we unsigned. unsigned. Yeah. And we so have we're, not ratified. We're, we're in a mixed place. But um, it, so that we, we wouldn't automatically accept being subject ourselves or having our service members, et cetera, subject. But there are, have been cases where we go along because in that case we don't have an issue with it. So it's not, it's not a great model. Uh, if you want the international institution to work, and I completely grant you that uh, perspective. We are so close to out of time, but I, I want to uh, use my prerogative to ask you the last question, which mm -hmm. is, I guess you've been officially out of the post for, what, like a month or yeah. something? Yeah. Um, uh, and so what advice would you give your uh, successor? What challenges? <sighs> Do you think that uh, that he will face, a, 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 in addition to getting confirmed by this dysfunctional Congress? But assuming that that happens, um, what do you think the, the the challenges are that that he will face? Mm. Wow. So I will. Uh, to, to, there's challenges he'll face, but what would I recommend? Let's start with what would I recommend? I I think human face-to-face -face contact. I mean. It's so valuable. Go out and meet your colleagues. Spend time with your colleagues. Make friends with your colleagues. They're your partners. I mean, the caliber of diplomats in Geneva is stellar. They are the, some of the best people. I mean, it's just, that was hands down the, the most wonderful part of the job was working with diplomats from around the world of the highest caliber. And just, I've made incredible friends. And um, I feel like it was, a, a, you know, an opportunity of a lifetime to work with some of these people. Um, and I'd say you, you cannot understand until you get there how essential that is to your ability to get anything done. So go meet people, befriend people, invite people over and get to know them and figure out how to work with them because that's how you get everything done. I'd also say go find civil society members that you know, you know, that you can communicate with, trust, um, because that's the other thing that makes the wheels turn, and you need to do that. Challenges that you'll face, um, I, I, I have to admit, I feel like my timing and, and my departure coincided with what I fear is a really dramatic shift in global public perception about US leadership on human rights, specifically because of this surveillance stuff and how it dovetails with our counterterrorism policy generally. And uh, I'm very concerned about that because I would say US leadership has been so important to turning around this institution. And if we lose our credibility, if we lose the sense of moral authority, which is what we relied upon, it's very damaging and very dangerous. And so um, I, I think that I would advise him to push the State Department and the White House to articulate the standards we use for the various practices we undertake that are causing such an uproar and to do a better job, make things more transparent and um, understandable to our international partners and, oh, by the way, understandable to your ambassadors. Because if you cannot articulate the rationale, you will not be effective in, in compelling others to go with you. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking Ambassador Donahoe. <laughs>